Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Connector series. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating in the conversations, which are really rich so far. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce you to Dr. Sarah Iqbal, and she'll be facilitating the session uh, titled Making the Case for Engagement and the Role of Connectors. I think it's best that Sarah introduces herself. Um, over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nabil, and uh, also to the Connectors team for inviting me to serve as a facilitator for this session. And I have to say, I really uh, enjoyed the first session and also the, uh, the thoughts and ideas that are still trickling in. And I'm really looking forward to learning more in, in this one. Uh, also, if I could uh, request Nabil, you or any of the organizers to let me know if you are, uh, if my voice is breaking, my audio, audio is breaking because my connection is playing up today for some for some reason. Um, so, well, um, Nabil, Nabil uh, requested me that I should probably tell, uh, talk a bit about my journey uh, from being a researcher to a connector. Uh, so before we dive into the session, um, I'll just very quickly, I hope it's, it's, it's brief, uh, take you through uh, you know, my uh, uh, journey so far. So while I'm currently an independent science engagement consultant based in New Delhi, India, I started my educational and professional journey in natural sciences. I did my PhD in biochemistry uh, from Oxford University, UK, and then I went on to do my postdoctoral research at uh, Scripps Research Institute in, in Florida, USFA. So while Oxford for me was a bit of a bubble when it came to interfacing with the public, and it also had a slightly ivory towerist attitude and approach to science and society engagement, uh, it was really during my postdoctoral research at uh, Scripps Research Institute that I realized the inevitable of sciences interface with society and its importance and also how the engagement, how this engagement, uh, in fact, mutual, is mutually beneficial for both science and, and society. And if I can also just take a minute to tell you a bit more about um, this place where I did my postdoctoral research uh, called the Scripps Research Institute, uh, because my experience there, uh, I think, might give you a bit a better idea about my motivation to enter public engagement as a connector. So the Scripps Research Institute is a not-for-profit organization which was actually founded by a philanthropist called Ellen Browning Scripps uh, in San Diego uh, area, uh, who apparently was inspired by the discovery of insulin. And its Florida campus, which is where I was based, was established in 2004 by Jeff Bush, uh, who was the governor of Florida at that time. So, and, and, and the hope was to untap the biotech potential of the state, which he hoped would result in um, social and economic development of the state. So here I was at an institution that was not only established uh, for promoting scholarship and research in science, but it housed social and economic aspirations of the civil polity. Also, the research at this institution was largely supported through philanthropy. So researchers like me had to frequently engage with uh, philanthropists and tell them about why our research matters and why it should be supported. And of course, uh, this was in addition to the various uh, grants that we would uh, apply uh, for to the government. But these interactions with non-science public really uh, provided a new point of gaze for our research. It helped us to identify and frame research questions and directions that our research could or you know, should take. And also to a large extent, it humanized our research and made us feel more responsible and also accountable. Um, also because the Florida campus was a fairly new and, and uh, a rather unusual entity for the locals, we used to engage regularly with the communities around our campus to not only help them appreciate science, but also the work at the institution and why uh, they were sharing this space with us in the first place. So this made me realize that uh, you know, research and knowledge uh, production in general doesn't take place in a vacuum and it's very much influenced by political, economic, uh, social, cultural factors and, and it is very much anchored in society. So this was kind of a realization of a researcher. And, and it was really through this collection of experiences that I started to wonder about uh, public's engagement with science, uh, which at that point, uh, and perhaps even now, is still a very fuzzy and a very researcher-centric concept. Uh, but at least it was enough 
to encourage me to explore this paradigm at uh, as a public engagement officer at a science funding organization in India called the DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance. And for the, those of you who are not familiar uh, with, uh, with this organization, it is an independent charity supported by Government of India and Welcome Trust in UK that was set up in 2009 to fund and build capacity in biomedical uh, and clinical and public health research in India. So at this organization, among various various other things, my work involved uh, sensitizing and enabling our grantees and other researchers and professionals to undertake uh, public engagement activities. And we did that through funding, training, and also by creating opportunities that would foster exchange between uh, the uh, scientific community and the various uh, public groups. Um, I should also mention here that at the time I uh, joined India Alliance, which was about six years ago, there was very little to absolutely no appreciation for or understanding of public engagement with science or research in the country. Um, so I had to also constantly educate myself and at the same time also educate myself within the context I was operating in and, uh, and at the same time make a case for public engagement both internally and externally uh, so that you know we could kind of sustain and explore and experiment you know more in this space. Um, and very recently, as of March of this year, I left the organization to work as an independent consultant. And among um, you know, other things, uh, what I'm trying to understand currently is the state of science communication and public engagement in India, uh, with a view to find ways to institutionalize and professionalize these fields in the country. Uh, this is, of course, uh, to some extent, uh, stems from my own professional identity crisis as to, you know, who am I, what is that I do, and, you know, where do people like me really fit into the grand scheme of things. And, uh, and I also recognize that institutionalizing public engagement is a Herculean task, not only because of just how complex, dynamic, and, uh, and also nebulous this space is in, 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 our, in our country, uh, but because it would require significant shift in academic and research culture in the country. And also perhaps more importantly, uh, a shift in the research funding culture in the country. So my work so far, I would say, it, you know, has not just involved enabling connections between science and society, uh, but it, it has also involved connecting the dots to try and make sense of the various modalities and implications of, of research and its intersections uh, with society. Uh, so with that long winded introduction out of the way, and, uh, and now that I've made some sort of segue into the uh, let's probably uh, dive into this really exciting session that has been put together by the amazing uh, Connectors workshop team. And so while the first half of the workshop focused on deconstructing the larger idea at source of community engagement within health research, uh, paradigm, which is influenced and, depend and is dependent on uh, various contexts and is facilitated by a variety of actors, uh, including the connectors. Uh, so in this session, through, through a case study and various group discussions, we will try to unpack the role and value of the connector engagement with health research. And as a reminder, we are defining connectors as uh, individuals, agencies, uh, creatives, and other organizations who play key roles in bridging the gap between research and communities. Uh, so they could be engagement experts, local charities, creative agencies, artists, private businesses, or community groups. And I think it might not be an overstatement to say that um, also based, my, based on my own experience that some of the most successful community engagement projects have emerged from collaboration between researchers, community members, and professionals who come from another sector entirely. So um, without much ado, I would like to invite uh, Michelle Temeris, who is a clinical manager at uh, the South African TB Vaccine Initiative, and uh, who will talk about how community engagement is beneficial for research and why connectors are essential. So uh, please drop your questions for Michelle in the chat box, uh, or you can also raise your virtual hand and turn on your microphone uh, during the Q&A session that will take place after Michelle's talk. Uh, so with that, uh, it's over to you, Michelle. Great, thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction. Um, my, as you said, my name is Michelle Tamaris. I'm a doctor at SATVI, which stands for South African TB Vaccine Initiative. 
Uh, we're a research group within the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And the, the group has been going since 2001. We've been operating in a small semi-rural town called Worcester, which is about 110 k's east of Cape Town. And I've been working there since 2003, so pretty much since the start of the group. Um, and in this time, we've done 29 TB vaccine trials on nine different candidates. We've done COVID vaccine trials, and we're also involved in TB drug and TB diagnostic trials. So we've done a lot of work, and we're currently a team of about 100 people based in Worcester. Um, I've got involved or interested in community engagement back in about 2008 when we were planning a phase three trial in infants in our area. And it sort of struck me that we needed such buy-in from the mothers and such, we were asking so much of them to, to entrust their four month old ba precious baby to us for this vaccine that they, they probably didn't really know, understand what they were signing for. And, how, how better to be able to explain, talk to them and communicate with them what this research was about and why it was important that they should take part in the research. And as it, with the, the start of the study, we developed a, co a comic book, which is here in the middle of my screen. Um, just checking my screen is showing, yeah. So this Karina's Choice was a comic book we developed for specifically for this trial, telling about a young mother's decision to enroll her child in the uh, TB vaccine trial, why she did it, why it was necessary. Um, one of the local schools converted this on their own without any input from us. They converted it into a, a half an hour play in their drama department. And I attended the play, the, the sole performance of this play. And I was so impressed and so, like, wow, where can we find funds to make more of this? How can we do more with something like this? And that's when I chanced upon Wellcome Trust's International Engagement Awards, as they were called then, and was lucky to receive one, to which helped us convert this comic book into a play using high school learners as the actors and with mentorship from the university's drama school. And we took this play on tour to um, the, all, the, all the high schools in the area and the high schools, they, they're large for, for us. It's, you know, there's a hundred, a thousand learner, learners plus in each school and performing on. Sorry to interrupt you, Michelle. Can you put your uh, slide on pre, uh, full screen? It's currently on the presenter screen. Sorry, is that better? A presenter better. Of you. Yeah, much better. Thank you so much. And okay. sorry to interrupt. So we then took this on a road show to all the local high schools. And it was fantastic. The kids, the learners had written the songs, the raps, they'd used um, tunes familiar to them from chants, from inter-school um, athletics and games. And you'd walk out of the auditorium at the end of the performance and hear the members of the audience repeating the chants, the, the, and the TB messages, the anti-TB stigma thing, uh, messages. And this really ignited something in me, this how much you can achieve and what you can achieve through drama, through communicating with the, engaging with the, the community at various levels. Um, it was, it's, this community engagement is very important to me that we've been in the same community for 20 years. We ask so much of them and there's, so, uh, there's nothing we could do without their cooperation. Um, and it's a fairly fixed small community. So we really need buy-in. And the only way you're gonna get buy-in is if you're transparent and open in your communication. And, and it has to be two ways. So people have to feel they, they're involved and not be just being researched. So this was really the start of uh, my community engagement um, story and became very much the start of SATVs because up till then, it. it Community engagement back in 2008, 2009 wasn't really a major feature on grant applications, but they never required more than about 50 words about what you would do to involve the community. And I just got asked for a stock paragraph to create a paragraph for everybody to just use. But more and more it's become important to us. And we've become, we, the whole organization has bought into the concept of community engagement 
getting involved, giving back to the community, um, helping to raise, my big thing is to, to raise scientific literacy and research literacy, because we ask really tricky things in consent documents nowadays, things about um, consent for testing, genetic testing and biomarkers and sample storage and biorepositories. And these are difficult concepts for anybody to grasp, but if you're scientific literacy or research literacy is sort of close to zero, how can you really give consent to what, to what we're asking? And how can, if our staff, uh, how, do I, how do I know our staff even understand this? So I really, it, it, a lot of my engagement has been sparked by a desire for the informed consent process to become more concerned, more, more informed. So these are just some scenes from our stage show with the, the high school performers. And they really had so much fun and it was a, a, an incredible event. And we followed that up by, with a second um, Welcome Trust grant, which gave us money. It was more for adult engagement, going into the streets, doing street theater, uh, mini sort of pop-ups outside supermarkets, um, planting actors inside the, the taxis, which are these minibuses, um, to start, the, particularly the taxi one tickled me, the, the one actor would have a mask on. I mean, that's way back in the days when somebody wearing a mask was something to be commented on. And the other one would start, why are you wearing a mask? And we'd and engage the passengers in the taxi about the first of all, basic topics about the hygiene and the need to wear a mask if you're coughing and suspect you have TB. But also to, I mean, the, the, the passengers just played into our hands. We had one woman who like from the back of this bus tried to climb over everybody to get out because I'm not being in the bus with this person. And then we could talk about stigma and talk about how the person must feel and why they should, you know, and why has TB got such a stigma in our area when it is so very, very common. So there were a lot of different topics we could address just through the street theater. And it all culminated in what's called the Easter festival in the town where all the churches in the town have bazaars and they block off must be about 10 blocks of the 10 streets in the town to have all the little jumble sales and bazaars and performances and music and even drag car racing. And we did our, the, the play that we had cr created for this performance, for this grant, which was called Linky's Lungs, um, we performed this at three different venues on the on the morning and walked through the streets with our guy on stilts drawing attention to our shows and in getting people to come and watch. Um, the bottom left photo is of the focus groups that we held before and after the performances to, to inform the script, trying to find out using um, social anthropologists to, uh, to run these focus groups, trying to discuss find out what is the basic feeling about you know stigma around TB what are the not the attitudes of the people of, towards people um, people in the community who have TB and um, toward the TB research and on the bottom right is just a photo of when we were performing in one of the local clinics we even got invited to perform in one of the local prisons which was a major breakthrough for us as part of the Easter festival, we had a local um, graffiti artist came and sort of supervised the creation of a graffiti wall for us. And we, I think clearly at the time, didn't really re realize what an imp impact this would have, created this wall out of six movable panels. So this was propped up against a church hall wall for the day. The community was invited to come and spray messages, draw whatever they wanted um, during the morning. And then Mac One, the, the graffiti artist involved, transformed this, what looked to me like a <laughs> real hogpotch, transformed it into this BTB wall. It's amazing. And because it's so mobile, we've been able to take it to, we've put it up in the local public libraries, we've put it up in the institutes um, for molecular medicine at UCT, at the health science faculty. We even, as you'll see on the right, we were invited to the, the group of actors from this Linky's Lungs were invited to perform on a um, 
magazine show, Hectic 99, which is a local magazine show for young adults on our television. And we took our BTB screens with us as our backdrop. So it really sort of, I'm not going to say paid for itself in, in more, not in monetary terms, but it's something we it keeps on living on. And at the bottom, I've put a link to a movie we produced with the actors and some of the collaborators where we, uh, the digital storytelling, everybody telling their own little story about the impact that being involved in this production um, and this project had had on them and on their lives. And it's really worth watching, especially listening to how it's changed these actors who for this Dinky's Lungs were unemployed adults in the community and how it's given them a purpose and a, a feeling of, of stature and, and made them into peer educators in their community, which is something we'd heard from our high school learners as well, that they're, they're now being approached for about TB and all sort of health science matters in the in the school, in the streets, in the shopping areas. Um, just quickly on to one of our other projects. Uh, more recently, we did something called a science in the classroom, where we actually, to encourage um, science and maths education amongst the high school pupils, especially amongst women. And it's, it's such badly taught and badly resourced subjects in a rural community like ours, particularly the poorer the school, the worse it is. These kids would go through five years of high school learning and in, of high school science learning and never touch a test tube or see an experiment being done. So we set up, this was all TB based. We set up four stands. It was about the diagnosis and treatment of TB, the, the laboratory side of TB, the tests we do, and about TB vaccines. So here you'll see that it was run by us and University of Stellenbosch, one of their um, research groups, and staffed by our staff, which interestingly turned out to be mainly girls, women, um, and giving the talks, showing the people, the kids were, it was very interactive. At the lab scene, they were allowed to, um, in groups of two and three, they extracted DNA from egg white. They had their photos taken in full sort of BSL-3 garb, which once again, PPE like that in those days was something very unique. But now nobody would be at all impressed if you arrived with full uh, PPE. But this is something we did with in collaboration with the Department of Education. They've since helped us. And I mean, they've really, they came, became, very much collaborators and helped with transport of the pupils, arranging the sessions, arranging for the schools to give these kids off. And we've done it now for three years in a row. It's a great project. And the last project I want to highlight is one that's ongoing at the moment, and it happens to be funded by Sidri Africa and a Wellcome Trust seed grant. Um, and this is to, uh, getting high school kids to let's talk about TB, which is the title of the project and using um, existing peer educators. So the high schools in the area have got delegated peer educators amongst the learners. And we've taken these groups and given them workshops about TB, about clinical research, about TB vaccines, about talking about stigma, get encouraging them with the idea to that they will talk about this back in their community. They are encouraged to, do at least one sort of community event, whether it's at their high school, at their church or wherever, talking about the issues around, around TB and TB research. And in fact, this last weekend, a group of them they attended a, a three-day workshop uh, run by the Red Cross Ra Hosp Children's Hospital in Cape Town's radio station. And here they gained the skills to do their own, produce their own short radio clip about talking about TB and um, the need for clinical research. And I think the most important message that I got from reading the aims of this radio workshop, and it applies to everything in communi um, community engagement in my mind, is that community communication is not only talking, but it's also listening. And listening is different from hearing. 
And this was the message they gave the kids when it comes to interviewing somebody for a radio program. But I think it really applies to community engagement and talking, communicating with the members of your community. It, we, it's not just a one-way process and it's not just being quiet while they talk back. It's actually listening and listening to what they're saying about their needs. And another message I've got picked up from the COVID vaccine hesitancy um, whole thing that's going on and how to counteract this is that you you have to be able to we have to be able to communicate to the public in real time and in their language that they can understand and you can't be partisan and you have to be actively engaged with the public and go where they are asking the questions and at the moment that's very much the comment section on the news articles in the newspaper or online on YouTube videos, in community Facebook pages, on what's community WhatsApp groups. You, you've got to take yourself out there. And I think it's a big challenge for the future is how to kind of get our community engagement more into social media and that we can actually reach people where they are communicating. And with that, I finish my talk. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Michelle. That was uh, really fascinating and very, very uh, interesting, exciting work. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, so there's one question for you, Michelle, in the chat, and can I request you to maybe respond to that question in the chat in the interest of time? Um, and, uh, and if there are any other questions, and if we have time left after the breakout groups, we can maybe take those uh, then. So uh, with that, uh, we will now break uh, out into small groups uh, to discuss the roles and benefits and challenges of connectors in engagement. Uh, so in this session, we would like to hear from you on your experiences of interdisciplinary engagement work and what types of connectors you think add value to projects, uh, what roles did they play and what benefits did working with them have. Uh, we would also like you to discuss the challenges you experienced either as connectors yourselves or as researchers or, or others. So what and also what kind of support do you think is needed to help these processes? So all right, so I hope that uh, you all had interesting discussions in your respective uh, breakout groups. And, and, uh, and now can I, can I request the facilitator or the note taker to maybe share some key points from your group, uh, either in the chat or, uh, or you, know, you could just raise your hand and uh, virtual hand and, and, and speak up, so. I can uh, go first. Sure. I yeah, hi, I'm Sean. I'm a, I work with IRB and Communications and Advocacy. I was in a group with Kat uh, Marnison, Chelika Mpande, and Kim Wadilov. Um, mm -hmm. And just as, a, I guess, some quick fire points, because I'm sure others want to speak. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of the roles and benefits uh, of connectors, we spoke about the bidi bidirectional link between the community and the research team. Um, and kind of the value of connectors and ensuring the needs and perspectives of community members are prioritized throughout the research. Um, and more specifically, we spoke about um, that researchers and community members don't need to be mutually exclusive to one another and that, uh, you know, it's so important to continue to create sustainable research via capacity strengthening and gaining and engaging and training local researchers. Mm -hmm. um, and regarding the interdisciplinary collaboration, uh, we were speaking about the need for diverse stakeholders to be engaged in these exercises and not just to be focusing on, um, you know, researchers who are experiencing community engagement, but bring in other outside, um, outside stakeholders, such as um, video makers, artists, um, uh, community educators, um, and people engaged in other creative arts as well. Um, and Regarding the challenges, we didn't have as much time to speak about that, but we uh, discussed how sometimes researchers can do more harm than good and that you need effective training mechanisms in place to make sure they're well versed in that. And with that in mind, that uh, researchers aren't always, you know, meant to be engaged, working in community engagement per se, you know, maybe they're not, uh, it's not their forte um, and that you need to, you know, make sure you are uh, training and prioritizing those people, those individuals who are 
you know, actively interested in good in, in community engagement to make sure that you can uh, really create effective um, research and community engagement. Yeah, that's uh, wonderful. Yeah, summary. wonderful. Thank you so much, Sean, for that summary. Uh, you guys packed up, packed in a lot in just those fifteen minutes. Uh, can I request uh, maybe one, one or two more groups uh, if they're re ready with their summary notes? So I can go. I can go for our group, um, Sarah. So there was I was with Nabil and Chow, and we I didn't we didn't stick strictly to the questions. I don't think, but they were great as a guiding as a, as guiding blocks. And so Nabil was talking about um, as an as an independent connector um, the the challenges that he has um, in regards of not having the support of a larger institution. Um, and that it often means as well that in his in, in his capacity he's not often included in the design of projects and it sometimes feels like he he, he drops in and, and drops out without being um you know having having a larger role in in, in the whole project and that is a, a frustration and a challenge however um the benefits of working in the way that he does are um that he has more freedom um and he is able to to work, you know, very collaboratively and very flexibly without kind of having the constraints of an institution um, saying, well, you can't do this and you can't do that, and really allowing him to do to work on egalitarian egalitarian structures. Um, and Chao was saying, in our context of Malaysia, um, community engagement is, and research is, is really is still a very new concept, a relatively new concept. And that they are still feeling their way very much in, in terms of, of testing and trying different approaches. Um, that we've had some success in developing a questionnaire um, asking asking uh, patients, um, you know, what the research should should look like and what should be involved in the research. Um, and that she's really looking um, for you know, to this network and to this to this wide community of people for um, for inputs and, and advice on how best to how best to proceed in the work that she's doing. So I think there's a really great opportunity there for for, for people to to connect with with Chow on this. And just briefly from from the. Um, from the Sustainable Livelihoods Foundation, I was just reflecting on a project that we are currently working um, on in the climate change arena. Um, and just saying that doing, I think this is this is something that's been brought up by other people before. It's an ongoing challenge and issue, but when you're doing really grounded participatory work um, with people who are living in deeply informed settlements, um, you know, to try and um, really bring forth um, ownership and empowerment in, in, in a research process and an engagement process just requires more time um, than we usually are given within the projects that we have, uh, that, you know, the funded projects that we have. I think um, if we honestly want to, if we honestly want to meet the core standards of engagement, which are put forward by big organizations like UNICEF, these are big, lofty, ambitious goals. And in order to meet all of them, uh, uh, the engagement um, sex sector, the engagement segment of work really needs to be recognized as something that takes a lot more time, especially when you're working with the most marginalized, um, most marginalized. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Jill. That was really, really insightful. Uh, Rachel, uh, would you like to go next? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so it was great to be talking with people from Malawi and South Africa and collecting those different perspectives. So we saw our roles, our role very much has been about being a bridge, being translators, facilitating conversations and negotiating difficulties between participants and communities and researchers. Um, and, and the benefits to us were that we we of, of doing this role is that um we all enjoyed gaining knowledge and so actually having this role meant that we were able to learn more and then pass that on to pe other, other people and i think we all felt pretty privileged uh, and proud to to be to be paid um for doing something that we, we love doing naturally anyway um just just getting those conversations going and really building those relationships that was really important to us so the challenges to us there was there was one very immediate challenge which i think a lot of people dealing with right now and that was the shift to online as a result of covid so um dealing with digital poverty 
um, trying to work out how you can reach people who haven't got the broadband, the IT access for Zoom and Teams and, and all these other things which have crapped up all over the place. Um, and, and, and one solution have been to very much do a lot more through social media that a lot of people could access Facebook, for example, um, and just so talking to people about how we could reach them best, how they could feel involved, how they could talk um, in a very how they could feel secure in how they were talking privately and they could share their thoughts. That was that was a big challenge and, and one that we were working to overcome. And the second one was more strategic. So in that there's a there's a general lack of recognition in our, you know, as to the role that we do. Um, I certainly found in the UK that PPI has taken off massively since NIHR has pushed it. And and also when I I can see the difference when I have senior researchers on a team who are very much the PPI is important. It's the first item on the agenda rather than the one at the bottom before any other business. Um, that has a massive impact. So yeah, we 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 recognised our need to have a continuous strategic funding stream rather than everything we rather than us constantly jumping one project to another, there needs to be something also linking those together so you can have that continuous relationship and keep things going rather than just jumping from one group to the next in response to different project funding. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, Pania, do you want to go next? Sure, Sara. So, uh, that didn't feel like 25 minutes, so we could just touch upon the first question, but in the discussion, we did discuss a couple of challenges. That's the second question. So while we're discussing the roles and benefits of connectors, the first point that came uh, was that how they are helpful in fostering trust when it comes to different groups working together and how trust is an integral part for collaborative uh, projects. And that is where the connectors would play a very important role. Um, also, the second was that how connectors are able to bring a fresh perspective to, uh, to the project because uh, they are not looking at uh, the project per se through the lens of a researcher or through the lens of a public, but they are uh, bringing different expertise to the table. Um, also, how they, they were they are a bridge between the public and the researchers and uh, how they enable the researchers to better engage with the community. Because if a researcher chooses to work with uh, connectors who are already uh, embedded in the community, then it's uh, it becomes really uh, easy to better understand the needs of the community, the language of the community, and to better engage with them. So that be becomes like an efficient way of engaging uh, with the community. So the project gets better in integrated uh, in the community. So a very interesting point that also came across when we were discussing is how they play a very important role in mediation and negotiation negotiation between the researcher and the and the public and while we were discussing uh, this aspect uh, we we also thought about uh, one of the challenge which is like while the connectors uh, remain behind the scene do they get the credit for the work that do they do and this is a major challenge and how we can overcome that maybe by institutionalizing or recognizing and appreciating um, collaborative public engagement projects where we understand that it's not just the researchers and the public, but different actors who come together uh, for a project. So overall, this has been our discussion. And uh, we, we were trying to define connectors because we found that it's a very interesting term and it's new. And uh, who would we like to define uh, as connectors in our respective uh, uh, places of work? So that's that's about it thank you great thank you so much banya um we can take one more uh, group if if there's anyone willing to share uh, a summary of their discussion I, I can... oh yeah sure i can go okay. so right. i was in a group with uh, lizelle smith and uh, we talked about uh, the roles and the benefits uh, of connectors as from a researcher's perspective, 
And we thought that, you know, as a researcher, when, when you're also being the, when you're also the connector, that it, you know, the role is to be, a re, you know, research communication, not just with your peers, but, you know, to the local public. And how do you do it? You know, as a research communicator, one of the things I learned was I have to be able to communicate my research to my grandmother and to my five-year-old. And so that's how, you know, so that's the role. And the benefit is that as a researcher, I learned by doing. And so those were the things that we came up with because we were both talking about it from a research perspective. But I really like what Bania said about the role of the communicator being the link between the researcher and the community and actually, you know, um, deconstructing a lot of the, um, you know, the, the ideas and the thinking that the researchers comes with because they're very loaded. And as a researcher, I recognize that they're not often conducive to community engagement. And so there is that need to unlearn a lot of things we learn as researchers. But on the common challenges perspective, obviously, you know, some of the others have talked about the funding, but we also talked about how that, you know, we can start community engagement without funding. If we keep waiting for the funding, we're not gonna be able to do it. So we need to start. And if we are, and one of the advantages is that it comes with no you know, strings attached. So you can actually do a lot of things and you can innovate and you know, change your project or your ideas as the community deems necessary. So you have so much more flexibility. And if you're able to do something uh, really good, then the funding will you know, obviously follow. So that was one thought we had you know, in the absence of, you know, ap in the need and absence of funding. What do you do? Do we not work? Well, we can continue to work. Well, the other thing is institutionalizing this idea that community engagement is not just something you do and go in there, you know, do it on as a side to your research project. It is a very key component of research. And, you know, we all uh, as researchers, we do IRBs, but I think we do, in, uh, we do injustice to the IRB because we're not giving the communities what they need, we are doing, you know, we have to overcome this paradigm of extractive research, you know, and what that extractive research has done has created a lot of mistrust among the communities, you know, communities do not like, you would have to, I, in my experience, you have to avoid calling yourself a researcher because they are averse to that. And so, overcoming this, uh, so this paradigm of extractive research needs to change and that has to be coming from the top and institutionalized, you know, funders have to become aware of it. And what that does is, um, you know, there's a lot of mistrust. So before we can build trust, we have to overcome the mistrust. And so that takes time. And so oftentimes these community engaged process, the uh, program projects, don't have the you know funding doesn't allow for that time so we need to you know somehow uh, make sure that it gets the right amount of time and so those are some of the challenges that we talked about in our conversation wow great great ideas and thoughts there uh, bono and and from everyone else and uh, i think in the interest of time we'll have to probably uh, close this session and uh, and thank you so much for for uh, those of you who've dropped your summaries in the chat box and if there's anyone else who would like to uh, over the next 10 minutes please do so or you could email them to Helen uh, or to Mesh I think Helen has dropped an email ID in the chat as well uh, so uh, big thanks again to all the contributors and uh, to Michelle and also to the workshop uh, organizers and I think with that I will hand over uh, back to Nabil. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, Michelle, and uh, everyone that contributed to a really rich conversation. I know that uh, my afternoon and evening will be hijacked by a lot of writing and contemplation around all of this content. Um, right now, I'd like to introduce you to someone that has uh, inspired and um, shifted my practice ever so slightly. Um, or not. Uh, his name is Felix Bivens. He's a participatory um, education and research advisor. He's a participatory um, a practitioner in different ways, um, to the point of establishing an alternative school called the Regenerative School. But um, 
Skip or Felix will introduce himself and provide a reflection for the day. Over to you, Skip. Hi, hi Nabil and everyone. Um, it's been really great to, to join this space today. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to join you all. It's been a, a really fascinating discussion. Um, my work in community engagement goes back about 20 years and primarily I have been researching and working on community engagement as a space for higher education as a whole to become more connected, alighted, and supportive of civil society as a whole. So generally working across many disciplines, not just public health and scientific research. So it's interesting to hear how this conversation in many ways mirrors and reflects those conversations around how higher education and knowledge production writ large um, often struggles with these issues. So just a couple of, of quick reflections um, on, on what I've heard and, and what I would maybe think um, as next directions for this conversation or how to deepen some of this conversation. Um, and some of the small group discussions and talking with the participants here, um, not everyone necessarily identified as being a connector, uh, which I think is, is interesting. I think it's important that probably we all try to think more about that as a space that we occupy. Um, I think there's certainly people beyond us who are connectors as well, but I think it's important about trying to bring that into our own practice. How do we embody the practices of balancing power, of dealing with power dynamics, dealing with the structures of inequality? Um, if we don't start practicing, practicing, practicing it ourselves, um, how do we really understand how others can do it and how they can help us do it? So I think it's important to kind of bring that into a process of self-reflection and self-action as a starting point. Um, one of the other things I see here, and there's been a, this comes in feel with community engagement, it comes with participatory research, is oftentimes these approaches are often kind of rooted in a paradigm of efficiency and creating better outcomes um, or facilitating better knowledge transfer. Um, they're not necessarily transformative. They're helping us do the thing that we do better or more easily for ourselves. It's not, um, it's doing things um, better instead of doing better things. And I, I would suggest that this idea of the connector can really be um, a lot more ambitious, that we could really scale it up beyond the idea of just helping us do the same thing better, more efficiently, more effectively. Um, so what I would suggest is really trying to, to think about a mirror of this. I think we have in our heads a very clear idea that connectors help us to connect to the community, to help us get access to different communities, different kinds of knowledge, different kinds of experience. But often this is kind of an outward trajectory from the research community out into these various other demographics, other communities, the marginalized, other groups that we feel we need to better understand, better connect with my suggestion would be to see this as a mirror and that we as connectors also need to play a pivotal role of allowing the community into the research sphere, into the research community and, and letting that move both ways that there is more public engagement into the institutions, into the cultures of that. As uh, Bona said, this is really institutionalization, but not just institutionalization, really reimagining how these things can operate and the community play a much deeper role in, in how our institutions work. Um, I did quite a bit of research around how public engagement can actually reshape institutional structures and cultures. And I think when you allow that kind of mirroring to happen, it's not just that our projects get better, but we actually begin to reimagine what our institutions, what our work in general begins to do. And that's really important because right now, I think if we keep it in a small box, it really is about how do we make our projects better it's not necessarily about how do we transform systems and institutions. And that's where so much of the disconnect, where so much of the injustice comes from is because we have systems that continue to operate in ways that perpetuate inequality, perpetuate injustice, perpetuate um, you know, ep epistemic injustice that knowledge is not respected equally and given equal stature. So for me, I think it would be to encourage you all to think about how do we bring the, the practice of the connector into our own bodies, into our own ways of working and then how do we actually not just bring that into the field as something in the community where we need connectors to connect with the community as a field, but how do we see our own institutions, our own research cultures as the field that also need to be explored, that also need engagement and transformation. And I think 
you know, it, it's an overused example that we've talked about, but obviously COVID vaccine hesitancy is just one dramatic example of the massive disconnect between public health communities and public health researchers and, and the public at large. And I think it's just a, maybe a, a reminder of how significant this work is. I think we've had the conversation of how do we help our institutions? How do we help our funders see how important connectors are? How do we help them see how important public engagement in this field is? And I think that is a tremendous example of when there is a disconnect that can be um, earth shattering uh, around the world. And it's so important that we make that shift and, and bring this invitation into our own institutions, our cultures, as well as making the invitation and creating spaces for ourselves to go out and better engage and better understand the perspectives of those outside of our institutions. So that's just a few quick reflections. I'm happy to uh, have further conversations with people over email or offline at some point, but thank you so much for the invitation and thanks for the Connectors team for a fantastic uh, program today. Thank you so much, uh, Felix. It's always wonderful to hear from you. I think one of the um, objectives that we are also personally interested in is uh, how do we also support each other? How do we form some sort of practice amongst and between ourselves so that we could actually be connecting to each other for our mutual benefit, but also to reach the populations and demographics in the work we choose and should be doing? Um, we would like to thank everyone for participating in this initial series. Um, thank you for all your thoughts, uh, your ideas, sharing your works, and especially for populating chat with questions which we need to better our practice and how to do things, Kip mentioned, um, not to do things better, but to better the way we do things. So I think that hopefully is, is a, a direct intention of this space. Um, we are also completely ready to engage with all of you in this co-establishment of this network. So we do ask that you provide us with your feedback, your thoughts, also just based on your own practice and those kind of issues or things that you need. Um, we will be forwarding everyone um, to the email that you registered with. We'll send you a feedback form. And also please feel free to tell us what you think needs to be presented in the series. Um, could we have the next slide, please, Rudy? Yes. So the next workshop will be held on the 19th of October. And this is a little bit more practical. We're looking at how do you manage collaborative projects? Um, who sets the agenda for these projects? We've heard a lot about uh, power dynamics and how to manage that within specific projects. And then we want to step into solution solving. How do we address these challenges by sharing with each other? So we do ask that you on Mesh, all content will be presented on Mesh. We ask as well that there are various forums on Mesh where you could introduce yourself, introduce your projects, share your problematic or the dynamics that you're currently facing so that hopefully this community of practice can step in and we can assist each other in our work in serving others. Um, we'd like to take this opportunity to thank all presenters, uh, facilitators and all contributors. Um, and all content will be featured on Mesh. Um, you could also access any of us through our social media. Um, the videos will be posted within the next few days, as well as the visuals produced by Nicolene Lowe. Um, and then a final thank you to the Welcome Trust for supporting this initiative in various ways. Uh, Klebisa, um, the tech support that is managing the Zoom platform. And then a big thank you to Mesh, Ewaza, and Interfer for making this happen. And we do ask that you please um, try and tell us what you'd like to see more of. Um, we will be opening registration to the next workshop in October soon. And in that space, provide us with whatever you think needs to be addressed in the next series. A big thank you to everyone. And um, we look forward to the next time we see you.